Welcome back. We are live for another episode of Growing With My Fellow Growers. I'm your host, Jack Greenstock, joined as always by an amazing panel. We've got some people back with us this week who we haven't seen in the past few weeks, so I'm going to start with them. Uh, since I normally go to Spartan Grown, who's not with us quite yet this week, I'll pass it over to Dr. MJ. Welcome back. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having me back. I just realized my camera isn't on. Well, my camera's never really on, but my logo isn't on. I was like off trying to find that. But yeah, I'm happy to be back. I've been gone for a few weeks. Uh, grow love to everybody out there. Looking forward to a great show. I am Dr. Coco from CocoForCannabis.com. Thank you so much for joining us again. It's good to have you back. And another uh, Growing With My Fellow Grower panelist who we haven't seen in a little while, Aaron the Grower. Welcome back. Thanks, Jack. Panel, good to be back. Um, this has honestly been a hellish month with these fires burning. So this is a nice relief to be here, knowing that I can kind of wind down and do this with you guys this Sunday. Um, I'm Aaron the Grower, ATG Acres on Instagram, YouTube, and atgacres.com. We are very glad to have you back, that's for sure. And next, I'll pass it to Noah the Grower. Yeah, hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm uh, Noah the Grower from uh, Instagram with two E's. Uh, you can find me there and uh, here most weeks as well, and uh, happy to be here. Happy to have you back. And uh, I'll pass it next over to Matthew Gates. Hey, everyone. Everyone can feel that a profound change is underway. Google it. Anyways, I'm Matthew Gates. I'm an IPM specialist. And um, if you want more information about pests, you can find me in two locations. You can find me at uh, Zenthanol YouTube channel. And you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram. I guess that's three uh, with the username at SyncAngel. And I wanted to say that I have big news because I recently identified to family level, um, kind of a newly documented pest in cannabis, at least to myself. And that would be the root mealybug. And I'm working with somebody in Chile currently um, to find some treatment solutions for people in austere IPM environments. So if you're interested in that, I have a video on it right now. You can go check out. I actually checked that out. It was very interesting. And uh cool to see I, it's not always a good thing to see new bugs but uh you know it's fascinating to document it and try and figure out what the best treatments are and i'll pass it over next to the american one hello jack panel and everyone in chat uh i'm the american one on the youtube and the american one underscore with underscore akeens on the ig and yeah it's always good to be here i'm uh, glad i made it and uh I'm looking forward to it so before we get started, I just wanted to say I am on the Jack Greenstock account on my computer and my phone today. So don't uh, tag the cheap home grow because it won't make it light up red. So if you're trying to get my attention, tag at Jack Greenstock or any of the other panelists that you see who are currently with us right now. And I think it'd be a good place to start with uh, just getting an update. I got one before the show started from Aaron on how he's doing. Uh, I know a lot of people are concerned and you know sending good thoughts and good vibes your way about the fire. So maybe you could give the uh, audience a little update on that. Yeah. Thanks for that opportunity, Jack. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of on the West side of the Caldor fire and it's, it was, it started, nobody paid attention to it, got out of control. And then they put a lot of people on it, but it's basically been threatening South Lake Tahoe now. So that's sort of further away from me. So um, the Western side of the fire, if you go look at the fire, it looks like a giant fish. And I'm sort of at the jaws of the fish. And um, so it, it's been really scary, man. Um, you know, we've had the trail. I live in a, I live in a fifth wheel trailer with my, you know, my family and my dogs. And, uh, you know, we've had to keep it empty in case of evacuation. So we've just, um, we've just been living on the edge of our seats, basically half moved in. But as the fire winds down now, we can kind of start to uh, settle back in. So it's nice. And and like I said earlier, it's just nice to see you guys finally again under somewhat normal circumstances, even though it's been been hell. But yeah, that's it, man. It's, if you zoom really close in um, that left side of the fire, the western side, it'll be like a uh, looks like a fish jaw. You might have to go to Cal Fire, Cal Fire's website to see it. But uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy, man. It's it's been hell. And, you know, we've been trying to get our shit together to move to Oklahoma all at the same time and um, a lot of obstacles. But, you know, I always say something about times like this. It's before anything great, there's just massive chaos. And that's what this is. It's the storm before the calm. 
I think there's a, one of the quotes from Batman. It's like, uh, always darkest just before the dawn or something like that. There you uh, go. Is a good one. And uh, it can be true at times for sure. In this case, I know the fire, it, some of the videos I've seen and I've been close by, we had one at my college a few years back and uh, it's very scary. And, uh, you know, an eye opener to see how uh, real it is for all, all the people that are impacted. So uh, definitely glad that it's not uh, moving your direction right now, but it can definitely change and hopefully uh, things stay moving the right direction and you can safely get to Oklahoma uh, as soon as possible. So uh, we're getting lots of love in the chat. I see a lot of uh, green hearts, uh, prayer emojis, all that good stuff. So lots of love from the chat. Just a reminder, everybody switch to the live chat so you can see all the messages and uh, be engaged with everything that's going on. Uh, It doesn't censor out any of the messages just randomly based on YouTube algorithms. You'll get to see all the comments and questions that might be coming our way soon. Let me just say thanks, chat. And and also, you know, one of the special chat member, I don't know if he's here tonight because I'm not watching the chat. Um, so I apologize for that. But C dub, I'm actually trimming up some weed for him because uh I, I owe that guy big time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a little delivery to him down there in San Diego or somewhere in between and uh got a little little gift for him. So shout out chat, shout out everybody that watches us and, and supports us. I'm definitely looking forward to meeting C-Dub from NorCal. He'll be C-Dub from SoCal soon or already. He's kind of uh, in the transition as well. And uh, I know that'll be a lot closer to me. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting to link up with him. I always enjoy meeting the people from the community. And uh, he has shown himself to be a really awesome person just in a lot of different ways. So shout out to C-Dub. Might be with us right now. Uh, I don't see him in the chat at this moment, but probably going to be listening to this at some point. So big cheers to C-Dub from NorCal. And uh, all the listeners up in NorCal and all around the world, we really appreciate all of you uh, being back another week. And I'm thinking about maybe throwing up a poll. I'm curious if uh, any of you guys have topics that you might want to discuss this week. And maybe we can have the uh, Dr. MJ might not have seen this yet, but we started doing uh, polls on YouTube in kind of uh, allowing the chat to pick, whether it's like chat Q&A, uh, talking about veg, like popping seeds or flour or harvesting, drying and curing, things like that was uh, one of the episodes. And I think it's nice to give them a little bit of uh, control over kind of what direction they want to see the show go in. For sure. Now sounds like fun. Let's do it. Does anybody on the, uh, who's listening right now have any suggestions for topics that they'd like to hear and, or anybody on the panel have any suggestions for topics that they'd like to have me put up for a poll? We're getting i I'm biased. We're getting a root me by question. Uh, we can talk about that at some point. Yeah, no, but, feel uh, that now while we're waiting. I mean, might as well. We talked about it a little bit in the intro, and I think it's really cool. Uh, and if people want more information, they can obviously find it on your page. But I'd love to hear a little bit uh, more for the people that just listen to the show. Absolutely. And I can be uh, succinct. So essentially, so I, I want to clear up um, because I did get a few comments that were asking, or that a lot of people actually came out of the woodwork to say that uh, they had actually seen this pest themselves. So I don't want to say that like, this is the first time it's ever been on cannabis. And in fact, actually, I think it's a really great point to hammer home that um, in general, because cannabis obviously is being grown more and more. So it's going to interact in areas with, you know, exotic pests for the cannabis. Um, and so we'll, we'll get interactions like that, uh, that we haven't really documented empirically before. I mean, certainly people have seen it before. Um, on other plants. And, and certainly this is the case apparently on cannabis too. But uh, I have even seen it, but I didn't get to document it. So I've finally documented it with a video footage from um, uh, somebody in Chile, in Santiago in particular. And, um, but apparently it's pretty common in Hawaii. It's pretty common in um, uh, the Caribbean from some people I've talked to. Uh, and other places in North America. And certainly, um, I believe it's also in uh, Europe, if I remember correctly. Root mealybugs are, well, they look like mealybugs for those people who've seen them. They're kind of oblong and white, but unlike most mealybugs, they have antennae that are like really obvious. Um, They're short, but uh, that's how you can tell them apart. They also have legs that um, actually work really, uh, you know, better than most mealybugs. Uh, And so they can actually move a little bit if they're disturbed. Um, You can identify them because they have, they produce a sort of a a white wax, like a lot of mealybugs do and a lot of other hemiptera. And um, so if you find this sort of like, like powdery whiteness on your roots, it could be a few things, right? But if you look and you kind of inspect and you see some like small white insects (laughs) moving around, 
uh, they're not root aphids. They are perhaps root mealybugs. And um, actually, the fellow that I've been talking to, um, they are treat. They are using a treatment that I've heard of before for root mealybugs, but never actually uh, utilized. And that is a hot water bath. Apparently, in um, some literature about root mealybug control, uh, people are using like 50 degree, 50 uh, Celsius degree water and, and dipping the root balls in for a short period of time. And apparently. And I've seen video footage at this point to see uh, that that's actually quite effective. But whether or not this is going to be, um, you know, too deleterious to the, the host plant, um, I'm waiting to see confirmation for that. And that's one of the reasons why I haven't been a big fan of uh, using that for other root pests. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the root meat, the bug in a nutshell. There are a few things you can do to treat it. Um, you could perhaps use Bouveria bassiana. I would expect that to be pretty useful. Um, based on its relativity to other similar insects that are susceptible. You can also use pyrethrin or as a direct and uh, drench sprays as well. Um, and yeah, and, and they uh, move between plants pretty readily. And, and it seems like, although it's a poorly understood family, it actually just became a family in a taxonomic sense, the rhizoechidae. Um, and I don't know what genus, I don't know what species I'm dealing with. So that part, um, I, I do not know. But uh, for those people who do come across it, those are some treatment options. You can also find them on my video on my YouTube channel, Zenthal. I think that was a great update. And I just posted a poll in the live chat for everybody to vote. I actually had to switch over to the Cheap Home Grow account because that's the account that runs the YouTube page and they're the only one that can make the poll. So if you do want to tag at Cheap Home Grow, I will see that on my computer or uh, Jack Greenstock, I can see on my phone. So I threw up a few topics that I had seen uh, asked by the guests, which are microbes and endophytes, heat and humidity tolerant strains, strains that don't mold outside, and then sun-grown PM problems slash bud rot too, um, and how to address those things. Then I also had a question from Lou Grown that I want to address quickly before we get into those topics that I didn't make this one of the topics because I think it, I, I have a very quick and effective solution that's affordable. Uh, this is the cheap home grow. So Lou Grown asks, how can I best patch up a two-year-old grow tent full of light leaks? Duct tape doesn't seem to stick to the tent material. Temporary fixes and more long-term fixes appreciated. I'm not paid by or endorsed. You know, I'm, I'm only endorsing it because I've seen it work very well. And if I had a bunch of light leaks that I needed to fix, I'd use it. The Flex Seal Spray, the little black can of that rubber, you can check if you have light leaks from certain areas by turning your light on in your tent, sealing it up, go while it's dark and find any of those pinholes, spray over top of it and it will cover it and it will last a very long time. I've seen many people use it to a very good effect. It looks basically like the outside of your tent. Most of them are black for the most part. So it blends in very well and it'll solve that problem very quickly. So I'm curious if anybody else has uh, thoughts on that before we get into some of the poll results and uh, allow the people to do their voting. Well, my thought is whatever you're doing, do it from the outside of the tent. I see a lot of people trying to patch the tents from the inside of the tent, um, but with negative air pressure or whatever you're doing, the Flex Steel stuff or there's other brands that make a similar product to that. Um, yeah, spraying it on from the outside should work brilliantly. And if you're nervous about it, like the chemicals of it getting inside the tent, you could put maybe like a paper towel or something on the inside of the spots that you're spraying. So if it were to leak through, it would be absorbed by that. Allow it to dry before you start running your ventilation again. Um, but I do think that, or many other products, I think uh, I've seen a lot of people do like to use uh, tapes and things like that, but uh, Tao, you unmuted there for a second. So I'm curious if you had any feedback on that one. Oh, but I was thinking someone once mentioned uh, cheap emergency blankets that have that that silver foil maybe for a floor i don't know about putting it on the inside but <clears throat> as a wall but yeah other than that yeah i would say buy a new tent too you can always get a new one i saw that as like a two dollar grow tent set up somebody went to the dollar store and they got themselves a hula hoop and an emergency blanket and they already had a grow light at their home and they basically tested the grow light like above their uh, countertop for growing like vegetables or whatever. And um, they did like par testing. And then they put the hula hoop with the, um, you know, basically mylar sheet 
around it and the you know ppfd went up significantly obviously and it was just a cheap way of doing it and eagle even suggested doing that if you like grow in a closet and you don't want to or have the ability of setting up a tent easily because of the size or shape you can just basically plaster the walls in those cheaply to get some good reflectivity for a very affordable cost be aware that most emergency basket air blankets are not light proof though they will let light through they're usually really thin mylar you can try to double them over sometimes but you know you can get mylar sheeting too that's actually made for this and it's really not that expensive if if that's what you're buying it for in the first place that's a good point it's definitely um they use people are in shock for like lifeguards and other things like it's uh, not necessarily what uh, the purpose is for um, but if you do double them up that would probably be more effective i'm thinking if it has a wall behind it people aren't going to be super concerned, but if it's like freestanding, like I was talking about with the hula hoop example, there'd be a lot of uh, light leaking through. Yeah, exactly. But again, the Mylar, I'm seeing the aluminum foil tape on the inside. I mean, these are all thoughts about fixing the tent from the inside. And I just really, again, encourage everybody to think about fixing their light, light leaks from the outside of the tent, not from the inside of the tent. That's a good point. Uh, does anybody have any more thoughts on that? Because it looks like we've got uh, at least 45 votes in so far, and uh, there's a clear first place one that we can get to. Not that. So it is a little bit general, but um, somebody typed in all caps. I think it was Cheddar Bob, endophytes, and then another person separately wrote microbes. And I was like, I think if we just did one of those, it'd be too vague in general, but Having both of them, it gives us a little bit more to talk about and maybe uh, some more people are knowledgeable, but uh, I guess without a specific endo fight in mind, um, I'd pass it first to Matthew and just see if he has general thoughts on either of those things. And then maybe we could ask the uh, chat if they have questions specifically related to either of those two topics, if they would like to tag uh, Xenthanol so he could see them on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just to say that like, you know, um, the microbiome in general and cannabis is being investigated more and more every year, which is something I'm super excited about. Um, I talk about a lot of these already, so I just want to rapid fire go through these for those who are new to the show, who haven't come across this before. I want to say that um, uh, in general, uh, microbial research is super context-based and uh, I do see some opinions floating around about microbes um, that kind of treat them like a panacea. They do have a ton of really, um, as we can as we can actually document, a ton of really great um, uh, effects on the resiliency of the uh, life in soils in general, plants and all the other things in soil. So I'm not trying to knock that, but I want to say that when it comes to like acquiring microbes however you're going to do this um it turned it seems that and i actually just posted a research report about this on my instagram um the report was called the microbiome stress project toward a global meta-analysis of environmental stressors and their effects on microbial communities this was really cool it's heady and technical but basically they said that the alpha diversity of the microbiome or the or soil microbiome actually even the plant microbiome um, uh, correlated for the most part with um, overall kind of resilience to biotic and abiotic stressors, so temperature, humidity, uh, pathogen ingress, um, things like this. Uh, alpha diversity is just a fancy way, it's an ecological way of saying, um, and back me up if I'm wrong with this, uh, doctor, uh, but uh, it's like the general species diversity in like a, like space, in a space or location. I don't know if, I'm pretty sure I have that right. Um, there's other kinds of diversity too, like beta and zeta, and even a shadow diversity, because um, it's kind of a, a sort of a statistics thing or like a sampling thing. So you might not sample everything. Anyways, point being is that endophytes, microbes, things like this, they some of them have very close relationships with plants. Some of them have sort of indirect relationships. And whenever you're acquiring these microbes, um, you should really pay attention to whether or not you actually know what you're getting, first of all, how you know that you know what you're getting. Um, because most microbes are actually not documented. Most microbes are not understood. Um, and certainly a lot of people can't tell what they have all the time. 
uh, they can make some readings that are that are useful and have merit. But uh, sometimes the difference between a pathogen and a beneficial is like one one SNP, one little piece of gene, of codons or gene, you know, or a few different or a few extra of one kind of gene that lets it like become a parasite easier. So it goes that route. Um, products and services that facilitate these microbes, just pay attention, see if there's research that backs up whether the microbes are actually going to do the thing that the product or service is supposed to do. And if you don't have, or if the, if the entity that's supplying that can't supply that data to you, um, just be a little bit skeptical because cannabis is, I feel, exploited by people who don't understand what is already kind of a complex and nuanced um, uh, discipline. And that's what I'll say about that. Brandon would be uh, probably chomping at the bit to start talking about microbes right now if he was here with us this week. Uh, shout out to Brandon, he's not with us. Uh, Bokashi Earthworks for his microbes and things like that. Um, but I'm curious if anybody else on the panel has thoughts on uh, microbes and endophytes before we move on to some of the other topics. I'll, I'll pretty much echo what Matt said or give you my perspective on pretty much share the same perspective, but um, microbes, great, get them, but they're a wild ride. You don't really know what you're in for. So you're better off creating um, an environment that's going to welcome the bacteria that you're after, endophytic bacteria, if that's what it is. Um, so look into the environmental conditions that make that bacteria happy before you inoculate for sure. That's it. I'm uh, choking a little bit over here, choking on a little white rhino uh, concentrate. And uh, it reminds me a little bit of a uh, chem, interestingly enough. But um, with that said, I'm curious if uh, the American one, Noah or Doc, have any thoughts on this topic before we get moving on. I'll to the next say one. something quick. I really like the idea of uh, getting beneficials on your plants so that the bad ones can't take hold because I, I, I think I experienced that once. So, yeah, like with the bud rod and PM, I think if you get some uh, beneficial fungi growing on your plant and other beneficials on it, it that'll have a harder time taking control. Uh, but yeah, Sync Angel might verify that or put me down on that. I don't know, really. I definitely agree with that. Um, it's, in fact, it's one of the sort of spheres of like epiphytes and endophytes. So like on the surface of the plant and inside the plant tissues that I'm super excited about and sort of research to that end where we can like even like facilitate the strains of, of microbes that do have that tendency, make them better at what they do or at least in a beneficial way to us, is something I'd really like to see, especially if we can like add like a, um, like a barrier, like a, like a living biofilm, essentially, that could maybe even secrete, who knows, like phytohormones to help with growth, um, you know, obviously exclusion through the, through like physical exclusion through presence is of course very helpful, um, secreting, uh, uh, you know, enzymes and peptides and things that are gonna be toxic to insects, and herbivores, um, obviously we already use these sorts of things, but um, if, we can find, if we can find ways to have microbes, bacteria and fungi, uh, et cetera, that can really sustain themselves in what is actually kind of a harsh environment. The surface of a leaf, I don't know if this is totally true, but in some capacity is kind of like a desert. Like, I don't know if you guys know, but um, the surface of the ocean, like in the middle of the ocean is sometimes classified as a desert despite of all the ocean, because it's actually a very harsh environment in which to live. Well, and uh, desert is um, classified by the amount of rainfall that it gets. So in certain spots of the ocean, I'm sure there's not tons of rainfall or maybe the ones that are classified as deserts, at least. That might be true. Um, maybe I'm using the word desert wrong now that I think about it. But it's, uh, I guess like a, as a desert, a brutal environment. Yeah, perhaps so. And maybe people say deserted at sea. So that could be a trick like in your mind. I don't know. That's but, very uh, possible. Dr. Um, MJ or yeah. Noah, do you guys have any thoughts on endophytes or microbes before uh, I give maybe my thoughts and then we move on to the next topic? 
No, I will always defer to our, our good friend, Matthew Gates, on this topic. Uh, but uh, go ahead there, Jack. I'm just curious. Uh, Noah, I know that when you were using your old recipe, you have a mix of things that you like to do. Um, and I imagine that there are some microbes in your mix. So I'm curious uh, before I kind of give my thoughts about uh, what you have to throw in here. Yeah, um, I've used a few different things. Um, one of the things I've been using uh, recently is I've been kind of just sprinkling a little bit of a great white in, inside. Um, another line that, I, that I've been kind of experimenting with a little bit right now is BioBiz. And I know that they just came out with a micro product. I haven't, uh, haven't used it yet, but I've always been, see, I mean, I do things differently from everybody else. I've always been a firm believer that a small amount of different things you can use once you have that stuff present, you can use to feed it. Uh, molasses is one thing that I've always done. I think the carbon that kind of helps feed the microbes and the beneficial bacteria and stuff. But, um, you know, I, I'm just kind of old school. I learned that from a hippie when I was, you know, in my twenties and uh, just kind of ran with it. And, um, actually Jack, I was talking to you about it a little bit. You were like, Hey, make sure you don't overdo it. And that's a trick that I do know. And I know not to overdo it, but, I, so I think maybe some people are in a problem with that, but that's pretty much the only thing that, you know, that I do, but, uh, and then I'll use different supplements that have stuff in it. You know what I mean? Like sea kelp and just different things. But, uh, yeah, I just, I have fun with it. And I've been experimenting and I'm still experimenting. So that's the beauty, man, is we're always learning. I, when I hear those words, they can seem like scary and technical. Um, but like the first thing that comes to my head when I hear endophyte, I think of the BB Bavaria Bassiana, I'm probably mispronouncing, but uh, Brandon and Matthew have both uh, talked kind of at length about that in the past, about how it can be effective for IPM. And uh, it is an uh, endophyte that is positive for cannabis and it can, you know, help you deal with certain pests, which I think is awesome. And as far as microbes, one of the ones that you said, uh, great white, it's not the one that I use. I use Mycos, but I also see Dynamico. There's a whole bunch of other, other micro products out there. Wow, Wallace. I think that a lot of them are going to be great. I personally believe that uh, mycorrhizal fungi and cannabis have some sort of beneficial relationship. I don't know the exact specifics of how long it takes to form or how much it's actually helping, but in my experience, it's tended to. And uh, I think there's a lot of products that whatever is available to people, uh, I would say try it on a plant versus one that doesn't have it and see if you like the results or not. And, um, you know, make the decision for yourself. And what about mammoth microbes? Does anybody on the panel use that one? I had a sample of it um, and I did use it for a seed run because I saw Ethos Genetics did a side by side where they showed a set of seeds where they made they use the mammoth microbes and then the one that they didn't and they weighed the seeds and the seeds that were using the mammoth microbes actually were a little bit heavier. So, and they looked a little bit darker and more tiger striped. And um, so I did feed it the little sample that I had to one of the seed crops that I had. And uh, I think that maybe it helps, but I like adding microbes. Anyway, I use Brandon's micro plus, which I think is a pretty similar um, concept. And if you're, I would say going to invest in microbes, I would say probably going to be more beneficial for people in soil, but it can be beneficial for people in hydroponics as well. Um, I just think that you're going to see probably more in my experience, I've seen more of a benefit uh, when introducing microbes to an organic setup, because in my mind's eye, the way I think about it is the microbes are sort of helping break down the things in the soil. They say a lot of people say you're not feeding the plant, you feed the soil. So the microbes are something that you're feeding to the soil to help break down the things that you put there that you know, okay, this has nitrogen, this has potassium, phosphorus, whatever it is, and it's not immediately available. Well, what helps break it down is the microbes. And so you provide ones that you think are going to be good and beneficial and help cycle nutrients, things like that. So it is a sort of a art and a science at the same time. And uh, I certainly haven't figured it all out myself. That's why it's always fun to have these discussions uh, with the panel and get everybody's different perspectives and uh, things like that. Because I also think a lot of the new listeners maybe are thinking about trying a product. Like when they hear microbes or whatever, um, maybe they see mycos at their, sh their shop and they're like, you know, it costs X amount of dollars. Like, is that worth it? Is it something that I'd want to try? And they can hear like, well, you know, no, the grower has tried the uh, great white and probably had good results with it as he mentioned it. And uh, I like the mycos and I see like Mendo Dope. Uh, I think they're sponsored by them. So they're probably a little bit biased, but <laughs> they uh, tend to use that one and it works for them. They grow some monster ass plants. So I think that it's definitely something worth considering. Again, not sponsored by any of these products, but it is uh, nice to share with the what listeners. Do you wanna, what what, wanna, what benefits oh. do you see from the, the mycos that you're using, Jack? Yeah, good question. 
So mainly just, uh, I would say root growth when I've done side by sides it, when, on transplants, I've just noticed stronger root systems. Uh, and, but when I was getting used to transplanting, just, uh, not seeing as much shock and that might just be, you know, a uh, placebo effect because I know which ones got mycos and which ones didn't. And I tend to think that the ones that got it respond a little bit quick, like more quickly. Um, but those are the two predominant things are the root system, both like on transplant. And when I'm finally done, uh, the plants that I put it in there always tend to have a very, very strong root system and a full pot of roots at the end that are like, you know, developed well, really well and healthy and um, less transplant shock if there is any. Um, so I've had it with no transplant shock without using it before in the past too. But um, I don't know. I think it, it it helps if you do mess up a little bit. It's like a tiny layer of insurance. In terms of uh, mammoth microbes, um, I've used that mammoth pea product to, I actually had, you know, I was doing soil testing on my living soil and I had a phosphorus. Phosphorus was a little low, but in the, in the um, suspension test, but it was high in the, like it was present. So I used the mammoth pea and it took about four weeks and I saw all of a sudden, a bunch of phosphorus available in the solution. So I can tell you that that product works. I don't know if it fits everybody's you know, scenario. You got to have low phosphorus for the phosphorus metabolizing uh, microbes to take effect. But yeah, look into it. Well, and it's Very known, cool. they, they market it as a phosphorus liberator is what they call it. It's liberating phosphorus from the soil. It's making it available. That's how they have described it in some of their, I don't know if it's marketing jargon or if that's technical it science works. terms, but I mean, that's technically, that. that's technically true, but I want to say this, um, uh, you know, people have heard me say this a lot and I'm going to say it again. Um, some of these interactions, all of these interactions, in fact, even taking the sugar, the phytosynth, the photosynthate from plants from the source, putting it in the sink. Um, even that costs the plant resources to do. Um, so, so too does all of these relationships are the direct ones anyways, like the, like the ones with the phosphorus mining of the mycorrhizae and that kind of stuff. And not all these microbes are proven to interact with cannabis even. So you should really look for that data specific to the crop that you're growing. And also uh, these relationships in nature can be attenuated uh, pretty severely if there's a, a, a large amount of the phosphorus. In fact, I was also posting about a situation where uh, nitrogen and nitrates uh, basically turned off um, the uh, nitrogen fixation uh, response in the, uh, the bacteria that would um, colonize uh, a legume. I think it was um, alfalfa. So, you know, nitrates, phosphorus, other nutrients, if they're high, and the microbial mutualist is going to like, you know, in some way, shape or form, fix that or get that to the plant. Um, those relationships are not going to necessarily develop well if you're well fertilized, believe it or not. So uh, I just wanted to mention, um, I could be misremembering what university it is. I want to say maybe it's uh, Colorado State University, but Mammoth did some research with hemp initially. And I think now, since it's more legal, they're doing research on cannabis specifically, trying to show that there is, uh, in fact, relationships. And like Aaron, he had, did, did soil testing and saw it work himself with cannabis. So I do think that is at least one. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to touch on, Noah mentioned earlier, was uh, the uh, molasses and how I kind of mentioned just to like go easy with it, because I think a lot of people tend to overdo that one, which in an organic soil system, I think can have the tendency to create a micro bloom and then sort of bust because they're all feeding on the sugar and they get this kind of giant bloom of one microbe. That's really happy with the molasses. It's eating that shit up, but is it good for your plant? Is it what your plant needs right at that moment? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but I think I don't know the exact specifics. I know like Duke Diamond mentioned, he would use it uh, to make his plants a nest. He would give molasses to try and make his plants fade before he, that was like his flush uh, in organics. But everybody sort of have, has a different time. Some people think it's like a flavor thing or a hardener, a bud hardener. So there's a lot of different theories on what the molasses does. Um, I just know at like larger scales, I've seen people use very small amounts of it and still get what they believe to be desired results. And uh, they kind of advocated using like much, much less than you think that you even need, uh, only using like a tiny bit, like a teaspoon or less per 
I don't know, a gallon. And um, a little bit goes a long way. As with most <laughs> things in growing, it tends to be we might want to overdo it. Um, somebody, I think it was Aaron who taught me like the whole more on gardener thing. It's like you don't want to put more on. Or maybe somebody else mentioned that. Uh, but it's kind of like a play on the words more on and more on gardener. Anyway, it's kind of like a dad joke, but it uh, is a good reminder not to overdo things, whether it's uh, organic inputs or, uh, you know, chemical or like nutrients, you know, salts or a liquid fertilizer. It's easy to overdo things in cannabis. And that's when we tend to see more problems than uh, when we underdo it. Fitting you mentioned senescence because I think age is one of those other really big factors that affects like those uh, subsoil interactions. Yeah, I would say uh, the last um, couple of weeks, if you want to use a little bit of molasses, I think jack it on the head. I, I would even use maybe like in the five to 10 milliliter uh, range per gallon. I would, you know, just a little bit goes a long ways and um, shake it up really well. You can it kind of get a little foamy. And um, I, I know I've noticed the difference between doing it and not doing it. So maybe it's my strain. My dirt soil, but uh, can I, I just I ask a question? I might have. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off at the end. You done? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, what kind of fertilization are you using? What do you use for your like base nutrients? Me personally? Yeah, that you're yeah, adding I, molasses I, to. I've used I've used a lot of different ones, but I, like I said, um, you know. Okay, so I've used molasses with my base. I've I've done it that way, but the way that I with a synthetic base, yes, with a synthetic base. But it's never I've never used a, an actual like synthetic synthetic base. Like everything I use is gonna have like like sea kelp and like different things in it. Bat guano. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna make up a, a thing a, a really black looking stuff that I'm gonna apply, and there might be some salts like like a liquid cool bloom or different things in there. And when I'm doing that, I might use a little bit of molasses like once a week, but that's not what I'm going to use molasses. What I'm going to use molasses is when I cut that stuff off in the last two weeks, not as a flush, as a rinse, and as a kind of just kind of like let my plants just kind of fade at the end. I'll give a little bit of that to the in the end. And I think that it will help with the taste. And uh, you so your idea is that the plants are uptaking the molasses, not that you're feeding sort of microbial colonies in the, the grow media that are then helping the plants. You're giving it to so that the plant uptakes it directly. I've done both. And yes, mainly um, I've done both. But you're right. I think towards the end. So the plant uptakes it. And that's why I think that you got to make sure you're not giving it. That's why every time I talk about molasses, I make sure that I'm not giving it uh, too much. And, um, it, you know, I, I'm aware that it could be just a placebo effect. But for me personally, it works um, with my setup. So t I always well, tell everybody. Yeah, do no, I don't want to I don't want to throw shade on that. I do think that it's important to recognize the, that the sort of commonly accepted reason that we would give molasses is for feeding microbes in in the soil not so that the plant sort of directly uptakes that. I'm not aware that there's, there's a bunch of junk in molasses. To be perfectly honest with you, molasses is the stuff that gets filtered off of refined sugar. Um, and so it's everything that comes out of the sugar cane that isn't sugar. And sort of the best molasses is, for growing at least, for feeding microbes, is the, the molasses that has the lowest sugar content, the black strap molasses. Black strap, yeah. Yeah, um, which is really what you're doing there is you're removing all of the sucrose from the, the sugar cane um, and leaving a bunch of other things behind um, with very little sugar. So it's not really a sweetener in, in the sense of there's very little sort of sweetness in it. There's a, a lot of sort of various minerals in it that are useful potentially to um, microbes in the soil. Um, but well, I, I don't know. I, I think that if you are giving it sort of to the plant, that that's, that's a different use and you're free to experiment with things like that. But I think that people should understand that at least that's why it's you generally used in horticulture is for feeding microbes. I, I I've definitely used it to feed microbes. Uh, yeah. I, I think you can use it for a lot of reasons and, uh, it, it depends on your setup. You know what I mean? If I was using like a thin AG or like 
uh, even like uh, general hydroponics and I was in like a cocoa base. Yeah, I, I don't think that that's ideal. But I think when you're talking about a soil that's got like some type of like crustaceans in it and different things where you're promoting this microbial stuff and you give yeah. it a little bit of molasses to feed that. I, I, I found good results with it. But I mean, to each their own. I always tell everybody that asks me advice about growing, I tell them, do what works for you and experiment. If somebody yeah. tells you to do something, don't do your whole garden. Do one plant and then figure out if it, it you know, I like to do, yeah. both do one. No, I, I like to clarify some things like it. this because there's a lot of practices that work really good in certain setups. And there's other practices that if you, there's other setups that if you do that same practice, it will cause huge problems. And, you know, new growers or even some experienced growers, if you guys set in sort of a, a style of doing things, you're going to think sometimes that it works well for everybody because it works well for me. But if you're fertilizing different, if you're in a different media, uh, really the fertilization, I mean, the biggest difference is like if you're amending fertilizers or li using with the uh, living soil or something like that, you want to avoid getting runoff. Um, if you're fertigating, mixing nutrients in with the soil, you want to get or in with the water, you want to get runoff every single time. And I see that kind of advice sort of going back and forth. And molasses, I kind of think is the same way. There's some growers that there's going to be a real benefit to using molasses. And for other growers, it's much more sort of an experimental thing um, that there's less evidence that it's going to sort of provoke the, the desired response. And again, you're, you're free to do that. I just like to sort of point out which growers things are going to benefit more. I 100% agree with everything you just said. Yeah, let me just say a couple of things. Um, uh, molasses does have this minuscule NPK. And like you, Doc said, there's definitely some micronutrients, I believe, in there. And... Uh, for all you KNF people, half of the, a lot of half of the, uh, whatchamacallit is brown sugar. Now brown sugar is just white sugar with the molasses on it still. And, uh, so yeah, when you're doing half, uh, brown sugar and half, uh, green leaves by weight, you're adding a lot of molasses into your gig anyway. So, uh, they that's makes a lot of that stuff at like out. one to a thousand though. Yeah. And I'd say, yeah, and know, it's 100% for feeding the microbes in Canada yeah, agriculture. I mean, right. that's what you're given, and, and the sugar in that case, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, something else. Oh, yeah. And even if you have, like, quote, a sterile hydroponic thing, you've heard about IMO collection. Like, there's, there's indigenous microorganisms floating around your house right now. They're going to land in on your water and your soil. So, molasses might actually help uh, some microbes that you didn't even know you had in your. Uh, your setup so I'll, that's a good point uh, yeah there you go to that one question i've always sort of been curious about is what what are the odds of attracting pests into the garden um and is there much of a risk I, of that? because i'm sort of thinking if it's a bug that eats molasses it's probably not going to be eating your plant but matthew you want to comment on on that yeah um lots of bugs like to eat sugar um sugar is great sugar uh and specifically plants are like the most abundant source of uh, carbohydrates, I think is the, is the, um, statement that I read, but, um, yeah, like, I mean, if we're talking about a cheap home grow, uh, then I think a lot of like, not necessarily agricultural, but residential pests come to mind. Um, flies of various kinds, uh, would love to like lay on, um, some sugar. Um, you know, if you're prone to, cockroaches for example they would be a big fan of that um possibly earwigs although um it, you know it kind of depends it, actually i just wanted to say since it was on my mind that um i know that people like to talk about bricks a lot and, and sugar content and sucrose in, in plants and how a higher bricks level indicates that it's a it's a better plant and that possibly even uh the plant cannot be uh, fed on by uh, insects but I recently posted a video, uh, not video, but a, um, a post about on Instagram about exactly this topic and in experimental uh, tests, they showed that um, basically like aphids, for example, can feed on artificially high levels of sugar, like something like between like 0.5, like 0 0.0, I think it was 0 0.15 and one mole uh, per liter, per microliter. I forget the exact, uh, equation off the top of my head. Uh, but it was a massive amount of sugar, like a brick, what would essentially be like a bricks of like 30 plus, you know, like four megapascals of like osmotic pressure 
uh, shunting into this small little insect. And it has such a great enzymatic um, response uh, that, it, that it totally um, neutralizes that osmotic pressure and brings it to the osmotic pressure of its gut and then voids a bunch of it as sugar. Um, I guess that's all a roundabout way of saying that tons of insects love sugar and um, you might get some other kinds of pests if you do that. So just be aware of that. If it's so, however have to feed on plants or some sort of membrane, uh, that I didn't want to leave that ambiguous. So it's a good yeah, point. Yeah, I think this would be such a little amount of molasses you're adding that it shouldn't be like you know sugary okay. smelling on your plate. Like yeah, and I don't know people. Someone in chat was saying they know someone who was a uh, foliar spraying molasses, and I don't think I, I don't know if that would be such a good idea. But in my, I wouldn't do that. I worked with some I people with spray roses. That would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I worked with people with spray roses, and uh, they were fighting mealybug actually. And there was a representative from. Oh, where was it from? Gosh, I'm forgetting right now actually. But it was some pesticide company, I believe, and they were suggesting. No, you know what? No, that's not true. It was. Well, I think it was a biocontrol company, actually. And they were mentioning, um, they were suggesting the application of molasses with um, something else, I think, as a way to um, well, negatively affect the this. bugs. Matt, if you uh, apply the Bavaria, Bavaria bassiana and then apply molasses water, would it help uh, cultivate the... The Variana Bassiana, however you say it. Sorry, my messing all that up. Well, that's okay. No, um, uh, I don't think that I don't think that it would be super useful um, for Bavaria uh, in that context. I think um, it does. Well, at the very least, it does best on like an insect host, and I think it's germination response. I think you can you can definitely grow it on agar and things like this. Um, so maybe there is there could be some level of like benefit, but I don't think you're going to really increase your colonization success uh, personally. And uh, back to the molasses spray for like mealybugs, um, uh, we tried it, it didn't work. <laughs> Just made the spray roses really sticky and all of the corridors had trouble cutting the roses. It was a big problem actually, now that I think about it. So I'm glad you reminded me of that anecdote. My question or comment about the uh molasses is and somebody in the chat just commented uh faux 420 abnormal says it's very true norcal growers way overuse molasses and uh i've seen some videos yeah people just like dumping like cups and cups and cups full and see that's what i've heard larger yeah gardens. that's what i'm familiar with so my thought as far as concern with that would be less so pests and maybe like more molds and mildews if it crusts up on a line or even just blocking your lines up just gunking up your if you're running it through anything like that's a uh, drip feeding so those would be my not necessarily ip i guess it's semi yeah. IP, ipm but just like yeah i would standards. if you are going to give molasses i would keep it out of your drip system um maybe maybe large yeah. mammals would like it too like rats and stuff small mammals and want to like chew on the line maybe yeah but we had a question from uh the bright side grower they said should organic growers be concerned with heavy metal uh plant accumulation in cannabis plants and my response would be typically no unless you're using some sort of input that you haven't checked or have some reason to be concerned that there's going to be large amounts of heavy metals like some people talk about like oh certain rock dust has uh this trace amounts of heavy metals and this and that but even using like those inputs most organic growers are showing heavy metal levels way lower than you would get in traditional or organic produce at the supermarket like i'm talking like one quarter like one half uh much much lower and so from what i've seen with heavy metals testing in cannabis unless you have heavy metals in your material which you might not find out until you do testing like um spartan grown's not with us but at mitten canico one of their crops using canna cocoa failed for cadmium which is a heavy metal so they only changed their cocoa to royal gold tuper on their second round they did all their same testing through Michigan's medical market and it came up clean. So they contacted Canon and said, Hey, you know, we failed for cadmium and we have a strong reason to believe that it was your cocoa. 
and uh, they wanted to let them know. And they're like, I can't remember the response, but uh, definitely be aware of that and just uh, yeah. try to do your the response was that you should shift to a different media. Um, it has to do with their uh, buffering process that they kind of use is leave some of that in the media and they're aware of it. That is unfortunate. So um, buyer beware uh, as far as that. So it's, that's not an organic grower thing. That's actually a cocoa grower thing. And um, it is something that I was aware of. And I would just say, try and, you know, source good cocoa and uh, Dr. MJ, I'm, Curious if you have any thoughts on in 2021, where would you get cocoa right now? Who is the the cocoa plug? And if you're in the North America, most of our listeners are in the U.S., but we have them all over the world. But uh, there yeah, a there's a that same Northern California company that you just quoted has been the one I've been using for the last several years. Royal Gold. Um, they're based out of Arcata up in Humboldt County. Um, and I, I talked to the uh, one of the um, product specialists at one of the high times conferences down here a couple of years ago and talked to them about sort of their cocoa process and their buffering process and all the things. I think they make a pretty good product and I've been using it since then. Um, there are others and you can always buffer your own, but there are some companies that, that do different things to fill those cation exchange sites. Um, and it, that appears to be the issue that, that uh, Spartan ground faced was, um, residual minerals from the buffering process. It is unfortunate because uh, they, you know, have to either retest the crop to see if it will pass or they can like concentrate it and then remove the heavy metals. Thankfully, heavy metals are actually something that are easy enough to separate. And I personally wouldn't want the product that comes off of it, but I've probably consumed some at some point unknowingly from the California market uh, that does, did something similar, you know, where they failed one test and then they went and extracted the heavy metals from it. And then they were able to test clean, which is uh, kind of remarkable to see. But I'm curious about um, Noah the grower, or not Noah the grower, uh, Aaron the grower, <clears throat> Aaron the grower, and the American one. If you guys have any thoughts on the whole heavy metal inputs in organic soils, do you guys worry about that at, at all as a uh, fellow soil grower? Um, I, it is a concern for sure. Um, it's one of the many concerns when you're sourcing materials for your, for soil building. Um, I would say stay my, my one thing is, you know, I hate to bash on a company, but as a mite, um, I've seen growers testing for aluminum with as for years. I don't know what they're doing now, but this is years ago. So, um, uh, you know, just be really, really careful. You know, don't, don't just cause somebody gives you a free sample of something at a show doesn't mean it's good for your soil. That's a great point. I wanted to plug, uh, and I, again, I'm not fil affiliated, but I've tried to find places that I could get organic inputs. I have a small garden. So oftentimes like doing the local stuff, like, and even local stuff can be contaminated and often needs much higher volume than I would need, but build a soil, uh, Jeremy over at build a soil does a lot of due diligence on his sourcing of inputs so that you can kind of rest easy. If you buy into his process and believe in him, which I, and many others do, uh, cause he has the testing and he'll show it if you go on his website on the inputs to make sure that they don't have any of the harmful things that we don't want. So that was uh, one, one comment I wanted to slip in there before I pass it back to the American one and uh, maybe get your comments on the heavy metals and soil. Yeah. When, it, when I started hearing about the heavy metals and I, obviously if you're going to get tested uh, you got to be more aware, I would say, but from what I understand what they allow in, for food consumption is like a lot more lenient than what they allow for cannabis. But like with anything, I would say, uh, like Aaron was saying, if you know something, it might have a possibility. I would just go lighter with the use of it or check it and see if it is that detrimental and stop using it altogether. Um, and yeah, I don't know enough to say that. Like I was, I think a heavy metal, I don't think it's going to end up in like, let's say the resin heads, but that's what people are saying. They're getting heavy metal testing on concentrates and there's heavy metal in it. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not wise enough to uh, give advice on this one. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> and uh, with that being said, I think uh, you could ask yourself or anybody who wants to use azomite or any of these other products that might have heavy metals, how much do you need that for your soil mix? Is there something else? Is there another input that you could source or use that potentially wouldn't have the threat of having a heavy metal? So oftentimes I think the answer. 
Oh, we lost him at the crucial part of the sentence. The answer is oftentimes yes. There is. I a think he's going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come out. With those things. You find it somewhere else that doesn't have heavy metals and you might not need it at all. Sorry, you Jeff. You're going to no. have to say yeah. it's a no. I, I knew no, it. It's, it. My connection is unstable, apparently. Uh-huh. Can you all hear me now? We can. Did you want there to are, repeat that? There are replacements for azomite and, you know, all kinds of rock dust. If you if you get a bad batch, there's all kinds of ways to, to circumvent those conditions. I feel like the operative word need uh, was very, you know, very good and should be emphasized here. Do you need it? Do you need it? Some other people in the comments uh, were saying something that I think is, that I kind of resonate with, which is the idea that like, uh, the cheap home grow podcast. I mean, we talk about all kinds of things, but like, you know, really kneeling down need versus maybe not need, or like, can you confirm this? Good? Like, are these microbes definitely going to work well for you or not? Like, is this input going to definitely work well for you? And even if, you, and if you do it, are you even going to measure it to find out that that was the case in the first place? Is I'll the thing that on- you're trying to measure measurable even? Yeah, a lot of the observations are anecdotal at best, right? I would say with a lot of the cannabis say. community. Yeah. But yeah. I will say this. I got me a sample of that mammoth pea one time. And on this one particular strain, I think it was like almost undoubtedly made a difference. And But <clears throat> that being said, there's so many variables in the soil that perhaps like that particular soil mix is why it needed it. And like now I wouldn't need it or you know what I mean? Because there's so many variables. So unless you're in a lab with, even then there's variables that aren't, you know. But- My general thought on that, Tao, is the more dialed in your soil is or whatever setup is already, adding something, uh, maybe you'll notice a difference. But like if, if you're like at 99% out of 100, that thing might, you might not notice that last 1%. Like the people that have it really dialed in. Uh, they might not notice very little difference because they're already having such a successful garden where somebody right. who's like struggling or doing okay, they add that one thing and maybe that unleashes the phosphorus Unlocks, that they didn't have. Yeah. And now they're being more successful than they were before. So it's like a totally true. one of those kind of things. It's all relative. Definitely. I, did post a, I posted a video like on the 27th of August about um, how I guess like this MIT professor was talking about, um, his name is uh, uh, Michael, Michael Short, and he was talking about how smoking can be a major source of radiation exposure because of like naturally occurring radon and its uh, derivatives um, in soil. And even like falls on, he was talking about tobacco specifically, falls on the leaves, then we concentrate all those leaves into like a stick, and then you, you smoke up all of those particles and um, apparently that's what he said. He's an MIT professor, not I. So you can check out his, um, uh, MIT course stuff. I think it's available on YouTube actually. I'll say tobacco is some nasty, nasty stuff. And, uh, we talked a little bit about smoking versus like vaping and the risk and things like that the other week, but our other topic that has the highest votes right now is strains that don't mold outside. So I'll pass that first over to Aaron, the grower. Um, it's a, you're going to want to stay away from Afghani tight packed indicas broadleaf. Those are all signs that you're going to get mold later down the road. I would, I would go after your hazes and your sours stuff. That's narrow leaf, a little bit larfier and um, keep your ventilation up in any way you can. Even if that's hanging uh, a can fan or a box fan next to your plant, and, um, and keeping that ventilation high. Now, keep in mind, if you get a, a rot problem, ventilation is the opposite of what you want because you're pushing that, mu- that <clears throat> mold around your, your plant. So it's a, it's a balance. But in the beginning, you want to you wanna pick a good strain, something nice and larfy, but is nice and you know sugary. But, um, but keep your ventilation high people love to hate on it but i think blue dream is a perfect example of something like that even like sure the, uh, re- replications of blue dream like humboldt seed organization had a fan version where they took super silver haze from uh, uh shanti baba across dj shorts uh and they made their own version of uh you know the dream and it 
stretches and it's very, you know, there's some haze phenos. And in my experience before I had good ventilation set up, I was like, I'm going to try that because it's known for being mold resistant, heat resistant. So in the first grow in a closet, I was like, this would be good. Other than the fact that it stretched way too much. So I should have vegetate way shorter. Uh, that was the, you know, learning point there, but it's definitely one that like Aaron just described, it's really sugar. It produced tons and tons of great hash, uh, both the trim and the larf bud that I didn't feel like you know, rolling up and smoking. But there are lots of strains that I think uh, fit that profile, um, but tend to be uh, land races that are a little bit non possible for a lot of people, like ties and uh, African strains and um, some of the stuff is in more towards the equatorial varieties uh, tend to do well in the high heat humidity and don't tend to mold like you're talking about the neural leaf varieties that naturally allow a little bit more airflow through the plant and uh, will prevent a lot of the molds but i'm curious if uh, anybody else panel has thoughts on heat or this one was strains that don't mold outside i just want to echo. go oh you first go ahead go ahead Seth Manuel. Uh, I was just going to, I was going to say something superfluous. Um, I agree with what Aaron and everyone else has said so far about like how the, um, the flower uh, structure and the branching structure can play a really important part. Um, I bang on a lot about like resistances and how like, um, I, I think a lot of people make claims about resistance that are at the very least not verified for obvious reasons. Um, but that doesn't discount the fact that there very likely is some level of resistance and uh, genetic assimilation and things like that um, that happen from progeny being exposed to stressors and that sort of a thing. And I'm excited to see more research into that. Um, I wanted to share with everyone, I guess, since I have the, the mic, uh, an article that I posted called cross infectivity of powdery mildew isolates originating from hemp and Japanese hop in New York, where they basically did a, a test to see if um, cannabis could uh, take in this uh, powdery mildew pathogen. And, and in fact, it did. And the really cool thing was that um, a cultivar called TJ's CBD showed what they called non-host resistance uh, when the spores germinated poorly post inoculation due to the what's called hypersensitive response. So they actually had photos of the spores that made a little hypha and a little penetration plug to like burrow into the tissue um, so they could parasitize it. And the cells essentially killed themselves way before it got the chance to do that um, and shut that process down. Um, and it seemed like there were other resistance effects too. So there's definitely, there's definitely some cool stuff out there and I'm excited to see more about it. That is a, a really interesting that you just brought that up. Um, my wife just walked in and totally lost my train of thought. Sorry for interrupting. All right. Well, since I'm unmuted, I was just going to say um, you could go like the opposite way of what Aaron was saying with the thin leaf ones and try and find some strains that finish really early and, uh, you know, maybe risk a little. But you could also, with <clears throat> do the light depth and that'll save you, you know, getting into that weather where it's going to promote bud rot and PM. So yeah, that's what I would. Uh, that's genius. Tal. And, and you know what, I'll even, I'll take your advice and I'll say, I have a strain in mind for people that want a fast finishing strain yeah. that is actually narrow leaf. Okay. It's going to be, it's going to be slurricane from in-house. So that's to do across the purple. That's punch. the both worlds. Uh oh, I froze. Did you, you froze, froze and, I freeze? and Jack was uh, Jack had the accordion effect. On the um, oh, that's my bad. So yeah, dude, I can get that thing to finish in six or seven weeks. It's unbelievable, and I have um, finest's cut. So finest is a company here in Sacramento area um, that that hunted it. But yeah, that's that's a phenomenal strain, and the Smell is incredible. The look is incredible. There you go. And you had the in-house version. Say again. Yours is from in-house genetics. What you were saying? Because yes, it's it's uh it's an in-house strain selected by finest, and that's pH finest. Because there's that was kind of a controversy 
slurking does the exact same for cross. I can't remember who it is right now. Uh, my connection is unstable. I hope you can hear me. Shit, but I missed it. Same. What'd you... you mind repeating? My connection is fucked up. Worst time, apparently. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. This is turning into a comedy show. Yes. This I apologize. I need to get a new internet provider. They're uh, not doing well, apparently. But yeah, the cross is uh, Purple Punch to Dosido, and the Dosido breeder is one of them. Uh, the guys who claim, you know, the Slurricane strain, they released it as well as in house, uh, in house, mm. and somebody else that I, I can't think of their name right now. Gotcha. I didn't even know the drama. I just uh, always curious because I see Slurricane, it's, it's become very popular, and I'm a Purple Punch and Purple Punch cross fan. So, I know you are. Yeah. It's good. They look good. And uh, I vote. Uh, I think it can get you there. Girl, right? Hell yeah. It's an easy one for sure. It's a good starter kit, that purple punch for breeders or growers. I remembered what I wanted to say about Matthew's uh, comments with the uh, CBD that was resistant to the PM. And that was just that I remember a study where removed like all the THC synthase from uh, crop. So, and then that one ended up getting a bunch of powdery mildew and like yeah. CBD synthase can create a little bit of THC. So if it's just a pure CBD plant, there is a small element that has THC in there. So us as THC growers, maybe have at least some tiny amounts of, uh, I don't know if it's THC alone that's creating some immunity, but within that gene pool, something is uh, helping somehow. What it was, was there was a gene cassette that got deleted and that gene cassette contained resistance genes that confer that had a, they conferred a resistance towards fung fungi in general. Um, so like various fungal pathogens, and I don't know how those genes conferred the resistance. So of course they do something specific. It's not just like, there's a big R on the gene that says no fungi allowed. And the fungus is like, no, I can't go in there. You know, there's something specifically happening <laughs> physiologically, and I don't know what that is. Uh, but you're right. It's, it's interesting. This is a TJ CBD, it was called. I don't know anything about it, um, but uh, it probably didn't have that gene cassette deletion. So we talked a little bit about strains that don't mold outside. Does anybody else have on that before we go to heat tolerant and heat resistant strains? I know that uh, in the Pacific Northwest area that I am, uh, I know guys that used to use uh, Cynix outside because it was kind of an earlier finisher, kind of had the, the thinner leaves, and um, that uh, it, and a guy even told me, "Hey, this is a good one to grow in the the you know Portland, Oregon area." Uh, the guys use it outside, so I know about that one. Twenty twenty Mendocino grows up in Mendocino. He has a greenhouse set up and. Uh... He likes the biscotti recently because he uh, said it's a pretty fast finisher and it, anything that he grows has to do well in his environment, which uh, tends to be high heat of the season. So uh, his gear general, he claims is because he breeds it and he's in the commercial market here in California. Uh, I think he's got a lot of strains that will do well in that type of environment. So as far as getting into the next topic, it says heat and humidity tolerant strains. That's where I would kind of start off. Uh, as far as if you're trying to get seeds from somebody here in the, um, a lot of people really, really like their strains and Spartan grown and won a competition with, uh, so he's not here with us, but got to give him the shout outs in a while. Us. Doc, do you have any strains that have done well in high heat? I know you tend to take the summer off because it's just so hot and manageable, but, um, if you've ever tried to brave the summer grow, uh, have you ever had any, hey man, I mean, this is. <laughs> Yeah, I really do try to, to avoid um, using too much air conditioning. Um, and I didn't really have the option to use too much air conditioning in my last place. I will now. And it's sort of like, I, I don't know. I'd still, I still like to try to avoid heat. And, uh, you know, here, that has typically meant just taking like July and August off. I could start again at the end of August and, and get plants growing by the fall um, and still do three harvests a year. Um, but I almost always have a harvest in July. And so your question gets me to think about like which of my plants that I've harvested recently in July were the best. And I just, 
I mean, I'll put this out there. My July harvest is always my lowest quality harvest. And the December harvest is always the, the highest quality harvest. And I think that that's because, um, at least in my last grow setup, I was able to control the, the temperature and the climate so much better in November and December than I was in June and July. Um, and the other so side your AC, of that. Your AC is your terroir. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the other side of that is is just that I usually grow autos then. So because we're doing the spring auto flower challenge. So I, I don't know. I, I, my spring into summer grow has been pretty weird for like the last three years um, and not kind of representative of the other ones. And but that is another idea for people struggling with outdoor late season harvests is, um, yeah, growing autos. I think we we're talking about faster flowering strains or light depth, but uh, auto flowers would be the other way to, to try to beat the, the season change. Um, and the other side of that is, you know, different climates are going to have a lot of different kinds of issues in, you know, October. Um, so it, it sort of depends on where you are. But no, to straight answer the question, I don't have a strain that I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw my weight behind for the, the high heat right now. I'll think about it, though. That's a, you know, at least respectable. You're not just going to throw one out there, bullshit. Like, hey, use this, even though that worked well. So I, I respect that. Uh, as autos go, and a story you told back when about your wife just growing one in like the window has inspired me because I was gifted some autos that are actually from like respectable readers. I still, even though I smoke really good autos, haven't been able to convince myself fuck, connections on stable course. Grow one under my light. And uh, I'm thinking about just growing one in like my living room and letting the yeah. sun that naturally come they're you know, fun they're fun house plants just just grow an auto as a house plan we should start a little campaign that's what i'm going to try and do there was a group call for for a while that they sold like a fabric pot like some soil and like even like a little watering cup and some instructions like all you need is a seed so you plant your seed and it was just like you you know move it around the house if you're at home and attract this whatever but uh some people, you know, have some successful little harvest. Shout out to Canna Blind Guy up in San Francisco, my buddy. I met at the Tommy Chong uh, meetup. He had some plants that he just grew in his windowsill. It's like he's grown them in like cups. I wish he would have picture sooner. I could have helped him have some more success, but he was able to get himself a harvest. A uh, legally blind individual growing in basically like beer cups in his windowsill on low uh, budget was able to have success. So anybody out there who hasn't tried it yet, uh, no excuse, you know get yourself growing. You know, there's so many ways to do it. Uh, the levels of success are so far and wide. Even just having one planted yourself, like if you just do grows from uh, whoever, I can't remember his name right now, but getting yourself one bud is just such a satisfaction for yourself to try and be able to get, and get yourself for that first time off your own plan. It's a super empowering. I want to Anybody who's in the chat listening who isn't already growing, definitely got to encourage you to grow on as soon as possible. Yeah, that's an excellent way to grow is get some autos and just pop them in a pot and water them or whatever. Give them some, some fertilizer, take care of them, but don't stress about trying to do a high production run. One of the other things I just want to point out to everybody is, you know, we're like a lot of people enter cannabis growing as like hobbyist cultivators, but then they're trying to grow crops for sort of maximum production, um, pushing all the limits right up against it, sort of driving the plants. Um, and it, it can be tougher getting yourself just some sort of gardening experience like that. It's an awesome way to do and to sort of take some of the pressure off of, of uh, I don't know, off of the grow. I just encourage people to grow. The one thing that comes up a lot and the, the way that I don't think you should get into growing, and I, you know, I've said this on the show in the past, but it's been probably a couple of years, is finding a bag seed in the bag you buy from your buddy or from the dispensary or whatever and trying to grow that because so many growers just get disillusioned by the whole idea of growing cannabis because they end up with Hermes or other plants that are, are sort of difficult and problematic to grow. So um but I love the idea of buying some autos and growing them in your window. So we would just like in the middle of the living room, get so much natural light from every gen, basically, you know, all day long that I think, uh, despite my plants probably being eaten by a cat, 
I, I have two of them that do like to uh, trim the lower leaves off of a plant. If I get it big enough, uh, I think it'll survive. The early few days, I'll just have to put something around it to protect it. But I think it's like, going to be a viable option. So green stock off in the living room coming soon. Uh, we'll see what the wife thinks about it as well. But I don't know. It'll be a fun, fun project. We'll see. Always good to have more cannabis, and less cannabis, right? As long as it's uh, in your legal limits. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't hear a lot of people complaining about. It. I just have too much cannabis, and that's my biggest problem in life. Some people do complain about having too much plant, though. That that definitely happens. But too much harvested cannabis, I don't think that's a real problem. I don't know, man. Did y'all see my harvest this year? It was crazy. <laughs> You can, you can just uh, <laughs> leave some of it here at the green household on your way over to Oklahoma if it was too much for you. you know, well, we'll yeah, let's yeah, sure, yeah. yeah, If you just, do I'll end up with that problem, it's easy trail. to solve. Oh, yeah, for sure it is. Yep. So, Noah, uh, I'm curious if you, I know you've been growing under HPS for a long time and you've got your AC pretty dialed in. up or if ac fails for one reason have you noticed anything or even just before you had all the ac anything works well in the heat in your experience no um i have not had great experience as a matter of fact i would say the other route i would say that i've had experience with plants that don't perform well in the heat so um no i i, I my key was to get the ac to get you know a lot of my strains they like to even be next to the ac so i think that um, you know, I had a strain a while back called Orange Blossom that did pretty well in the heat, but most of my stuff, you know, it, it definitely like anything cookies based is really, you know, does heat stress. But I will say that uh, there's a guy that's usually on our panel, uh, Penetrator Breeding, uh, and he 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 tests all his stuff. And um, if I was looking for some seeds that uh, were going to be, some, you know, that could handle that, I'd probably look that route. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Kyle has done a bunch of work, heat stressing. Uh, oh, damn it. My internet connection. Every time I talk, maybe it knows I'm talking. For, for strains, Kyle. Jack, just to touch on that. I mean, there's some things you can do if you're dealing with high heat. And I think we talked about this a, a couple of months ago, sorry, at the beginning of the summer. But one of my big tips would be to increase the water flow through the plant. And since I'm fertigating, I do that by lowering the electrical conductivity. So um, providing less nutrients in each event, increasing the number of events, letting the plant cycle more water through itself, um, preventing it from getting any kind of, of water stress in those situations of, of sort of really high uh, VPD is really what you're dealing with there. And when the really high VPD, the plant needs to be able to transpire a lot of water. Um, but in terms of sort of, I mean, at that point, it's already way too late for me. I, you know, the plants are already almost ready to harvest. So in terms of selecting strands, you have to come at that from the beginning. And if you know, you're going to face a situation like that in the beginning, I would say to, to try to be better prepared for it. Like with equipment and stuff. The American one, any, uh, strains that stand out to you that have done well in high heat or humidity in particular? Um, no, I, I've been pretty good, but I haven't seen any that really stood out that did better. Um, this last couple of heat waves, I, my plants definitely put a hurt, got a hurt on. Um, but I agree with Doc. If you could do what he said and uh, give them more water with not so much nutrients, that helps. And if you're in organics, you can't just keep flooding them with water. Um, I foliar, it, as soon as, before the lights come on, if it's really, if I know it's going to be dry and hot, it's wet and hot yeah you know that's going to be a vpd that should be all right so other than that uh a lot of people say that the thin fluffy strains have you know less problems with uh you know mold and stuff too so funny we say that in organics now that i'm in the earth boxes and these have crazy ass root systems now that it's hot on a hot day i can guarantee when i go and check that night or in the morning, uh, be sending me dry. Mix it up within 24 hours every single time at this point where I'm at flower. And it's amazing to see how quick I can cycle through a couple of gallons of water for just a few uh, relatively small plants. Yeah. It's powerful to have that 
sort of, I, I believe that system works really well. Sub irrigated planters with the basically cap covering the top so that it wicks up. Uh, figured that out and uh, it has definitely helped a lot of organic growers out. Cause see everybody who uses them and this is like, again, I'm not promoting this, but everybody I see using them has beautiful, healthy plants. So I was like, Hey, shit, it fits in my space. Might as well try it. And uh, in my experience, it's much easier than growing uh, in organic soil with pots. So whether it's a city picker like Spartan grows in or a uh, earth box, I think that though it's like your own. I see people with five gallon buckets. This one lady grew like a six foot corn plant in a five gallon home Depot bucket where she just buried a milk jug, drilled some holes through it, uh, put a PVC pipe through it. And that's where she'd fill it with water. And then the soil grew down, basically grow down to the bottom. You have a little uh, water basin at the bottom and very successful, low maintenance uh, organic growing. So can't uh, advocate that enough for sure. We have a more sun-grown question. Aaron, the girl will be uh, able to attend to. Uh, this is the final one in the topic poll. We've got about 40 minutes left, so maybe we'll do a little Q&A afterwards. But uh, they say sun-grown problems, PM and bud rot too. So Aaron, uh, as an outdoor gardener uh, with a lot of experience with that, how do you typically tend to deal with those two things? Um, well, I don't see a lot of PM unless I pack plants in and don't defoliate, uh, the lowers. Um, like if I don't strip, I've seen, you know, and I, and I got larfy buds kind of all hanging on each other. I'll see some PM development on the leaves. And in those circumstances, I remove the infected foliage. And if I'm concerned that it's going to continue like the, that there's just not enough airflow in the canopy, I'll actually use uh, distilled vinegar on a rag and I'll just wipe the, the areas that were infected with the PM. Now, again, PM is not a big issue outdoors for me, um, but bud rot is. And that tends to come from just big, healthy, you know, donkers that, that don't get enough airflow on the inside and they're transpiring <clears throat> or, pers oh God, resp I don't know. They're, they're leaking water out from their insides and, um, and when they do that, it's got to have a place to go. And if there's bud everywhere, it has no place to go. So how do you deal with it? You don't grow the wrong strains. And when you see bud rot, you remove that infected tissue and about, I'd say about an inch below it. Usually bud rot lands in the densest part of the top colas. Um, not at the tips. So you'll, you may actually be able to salvage the tip of the cola. Um, but then there's going to be a crown area below the tip that's dense and wide. And, um, that's going to be where your bud rot starts. Um, and I'll add one more thing, um, to identify bud rot, you'll want to look at, look at your primary colas, the main big colas and look for a uh, yellowing or necrotic leaves, you know, dying tissue um, is going to be an indication. And when I see that, I will literally pry the bud open at that necrosis. I'll just pull the bud apart until I find the bud rot. Sometimes you won't find bud rot. Sometimes the rot is on the leaf, on this, you know, on that petiole and you can just remove it. No big deal. But oftentimes you'll, you'll see that necrosis. You'll dig into the bud and you'll start to see this brown or yellow or even if it's old, a white um, webbing. And at that point, you wanna take that down, throw it in the compost bin and, um, and count your lucky blessings that you have any weed left at all because botrytis can be a mother. That's all I'll say. Yeah. That's a great addition. Everything that he said and look, start looking as soon as the buds are there because that one yellow leaf you don't notice it but like you're saying there's going to be one leaf that looks funny or there's a dead leaf there you think it's nothing but if you once you pull that one out and look underneath there it could be a whole yeah. ugliness yeah and just like aaron said it's always like two three inches below the the tip top of of the fattest colas um, if you notice a dead leaf there, you, you got issues. The one thing that, that hasn't come up yet, I would just say about mitigating bread rot is training, um, topping the plant, not growing one apical dominant, um, cola, um, trying to split that dominance up so that the 
you know, there's just less of a chance of it. Do you do that, Aaron? Absolutely. And that's a really good point. You want to bring the density of each individual bud down and that's going to help. Yep. That's a really good point, dude. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of growers think when they're growing outdoors that they don't need to train at all because, you know, the, the plant knows how best to grow or whatever, but the plant doesn't really care about getting bud rot. Um, and you as the grower does. So yeah, topping them at least once and splitting the optical dominance, I think is a good, good tip. And even bud rot may benefit um, a plant, you know, uh, evolutionarily, you know, once it's developed seeds and it's at that stage of, of girth, it's ready to hit the ground. Anyway, what a, you know, this is a fast way to hit the ground, get, you know, rot the bud and the, you know, the bud hits the ground, the seed hits the ground and it can germinate faster. Yeah, exactly. The plant's interests are not always aligned with our interests. In fact, towards harvest time, you could argue that our plant, our interests are really diametrically opposed. <laughs> it's a really good point. Yeah. Opposites. Yeah. You know, I always, I always like to talk about how like cultivation techniques, like necessarily, you know, that's like the, maybe the number one, um, you know, example of like, the difference between cultivation versus like nature and you just touched on a great example like a lot of cannabis will grow christmas tree style you know with a massive um you know apical dominant flower that thing's gonna get way more molded over you know yeah. generally speaking than another um but you know but that's part of resistance you know there's there's biotic resistance from genes gene-based resistance and then there's like abiotic stuff and we like to use techniques to kind of make the abiotic stuff a little bit less uh, onerous. So I was just doing a little share screen here, um, going back a little bit to the heat and humidity resistant trains. This is when I was growing uh, 315 LE, which is meant for nine square feet. My tent is five square feet. So I had basically four square feet worth of extra lighting and a pretty high intensity grow light, uh, a HID, you know, ceramic metal halide. They're pretty, they produce a lot of heat for a small space. And this strain that I grew, it was called Spiked Punch. I used the hashtag Jack's Spiked Punch. And um, showing the video because it looks thing and uh, some of my most potent stuff that I ever had in my grow space. And just kind of going back to the heat and humidity, I had a lot of that. And with this harvest, there was only my biggest uh, probably going to be showing. You can see I overpacked the shit out of this tent. Nugs are laying on top of each other. There's leaves everywhere. Um, it's just a lot going on. But with that being said, harvest, there was only uh, 2.4 grams of bud rot in the material. And it was my weight, 11 grams. It was a top the uh, bigger colas. But with that being said, uh, strain, spiked punch, um, in one gallon pots of cocoa, each plant yield 0.5 uh, dried and trimmed like a bud. So it was... 11 ounces between just those two at Chernobyl tucked in there that had one ounce. So that was still like my harvest of the state in this uh, little five square feet. But definitely a uh, shout out to Vegan Doja, Doja DNA. It was a purple punch cross going back to what we were talking about there. Purple punch is a uh, G with so purple. And then that was crossed into uh, the Del Norte fuel, which is a kind of crazy combination. Uh, sativa crossed to Chem 4, crossed to uh, OG. So it's a uh, big mix of a poly hybrid, but yeah, it yielded really well. Um, it might not look the best to some people, but it was frosty. It had some pink grass. I'll uh, flip over to I think this is very close. You can see his buds literally had uh, pink red, where it's, I guess, cousin the velvet punch. Actually, here's a nug of it. Dried, trimmed, and stuff. Load. My interaction is clearly good. I'll throw it. So that's who I'm using. Uh, there. Not doing the best of jobs. <laughs> Internet connection unstable. Not surprised. There's some cherry pie. And this is the cousin, the velvet punch, which you can see is definitely more purple. Same breeder uh, made this Doja DNA, also known as the vegan Doja. But yeah, big fan of his gear. It's worked really well in my garden. Lots of frost, good flavor. And I just want to share those as a couple. Uh, I've switched to LED now from the CMH, and the heat is much, much more reasonable. My environments are actually considered quite optimal. I'm really happy with where they're at now. I have a much <laughs> more dialed in light, partially thanks to Dr. MJ and all the information I learned about, you know, grow lights and how to optimally size them for the grow space to not uh, provide way too much light and heat. So thank you to Doc for that and uh, many others like Grow Mouse and uh, 
got Shane from Migro and or Migro, however you want to pronounce it. There's lots of great light resources in the cannabis community, and they all helped me uh, have a lot easier job growing cannabis in my tiny little tent. Cheers, Jack. Glad that that stuff helps. <laughs>It's already 5.30. I can't believe it. We're uh, coming up to the final half hour. And normally I'd have to think like, oh, in 15 minutes, Spartan Grown will have to get his sign out in, but he's not with us this week again. Uh, big shout out to Spartan Grown. I'm not sure uh, if he gave me a reason or not. I probably forgot. That's uh, me being me, but uh, always welcome to come back whenever Spartan. Big uh, ups to you and the Michigan Bros Grow Show, which will be on in about 30 minutes. So cheers to those guys. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm curious if uh, anybody on the panel has a topic that maybe they want to touch back on that we talked about earlier or something that they want to bring up that we haven't been able to address so far this week. I guess I, I wanted to reiterate um, a point about, I saw some really good conversation uh, about like using microbes and like how to facilitate uh, microbial um, populations. And I guess I just want to touch on the fact that like in a lot of cases, you know, I, I would really, I, I think that more people should, if they can, uh, actually like record the results of their growth. I think it helps you to have like a grow journal in general, whether it's for pests uh, and documentation of that, uh, whether it's for like little interesting idiosyncrasies, you know, and how you're cultivating. Um, I know Dr. MJ has a great uh, example of many people who do something like this online. Um, but I think it's really useful because like, for example, you don't, I think most people don't really know what microbes are getting. They know maybe the microbes in a product, but they don't know if the microbes are actually alive always. They don't actually know, you know, if uh, they're being negatively affected by other microbes already on the plant or in the plant or things like this. So um, really, I think to some degree, um, you have to really just like confirm and, and know that, you know, and if you're not able to do that, um, or at least see some sort of benefit that seems to be different from your baseline, uh, then I think that it's a, it's a really good question as to like, whether it's economically a, a good move for you. Um, maybe it makes sense in a case where, you know, you probably decimated your population, uh, like with these root mealy bugs and somebody using, a uh, 50 degree water, you know, to scald the, uh, the insects off, that's probably going to negatively affect the microbes in the soil too. And on the surface of the roots. So maybe you should read right? 50 Celsius there, 50 Celsius, pretty hot. And that's a lot hotter hot. than 50 Fahrenheit. <laughs> yes. It was very, very hot. <laughs> Apparently it worked. I'm very curious to see if the plant has actually become very shocked. Um, but you know what I mean? So like, I don't know. I just feel like, I just feel kind of, I don't know. I don't know if it's a unique position, but I do feel kind of um, uh, agnostic about the, about certain microbes and their efficacy, especially since there's not a lot of research about it with cannabis. And I know from my own experiences and in, in education and research, continuing research that uh, microbial interactions are really, really um, specific to, or tend to be. Not all, the, not all of them, some of them are indirect, but the direct ones tend to be. So I'm just, uh, I'd love to see more ways for people to confirm that that's not super expensive or time consuming or um, damaging. I think that's a great point is uh, trying to get like the best research possible. But in some cases, like right now, I don't think we have it available to us. We know like the things that they definitely need, the plants need water and they, they need light. <laughs> some sort of medium to grow in but after that it sort of gets into a lot of uh, decision making for the grower and um, it can be tough because I think in some cases like a lot of growers will do something out of what feels like intuition or they just believe in another grower that they respect doing something and maybe I think somebody brought this up at another time and I, I like the kind of example um, a lot of people can get in their car and go drive it but they don't know how it works and we can use an iPhone. We have no idea what's underneath it. We couldn't fix it if it were up to us, but it works and we know how to operate it. And with gardening, um, cannabis or other plants, there's a lot of inputs and maybe there is research out there for it right now. Maybe there's not, maybe there will never be. Uh, sometimes it is bro science and uh, people will con you into paying for products that you don't need. So I think it is good to be a skeptic in life in general, uh, be skeptical, question things, 
do I need this? <laughs> is this uh, what it says it is even? Uh, who is evaluating that? What is the, you know, over, you know, body that's seeing that? Like people often get so caught up in like, oh, it's organic, so it's safe. Don't panic, it's organic is a hashtag I see. And it's like, that's just opening yourself up to potentially walking into failures, um, whether it's, you know, pesticides, heavy metals, other things. There was a guy uh, recently where he was growing a bunch of non-organic food, but he just filled out the organic farm labeling process. And it's like a multi-million dollar that you might remember. This was like, I think corn, rice, beans, all sorts. Of yes. Other I was thinking of this exact example, Jack. That's so funny. Yeah. So it's just like, we really have to be, I think, skeptical sometimes of uh, even what are believed to be uh, credible resources. And mm -hmm. I, I love that we have certain agencies and bodies that protect the safety of, of people. Uh, I think that it's great that we have like the, if you want to go flying on a plane, there's an agency that oversees uh, flying and they try to make sure that they're safe as possible. Um, so th there are certain agencies that I think are needed to regulate certain things. And um, in, in the cases that we don't have them, like in cannabis, a lot of the times, these grow shops and things are so unregulated, people will push stuff to you that they don't even know what it is because maybe they have an incentive. They make more money if they sell a product and maybe that one's more expensive. They don't know if it matters if you're going to spray it on something that you smoke or if you eat it or if it's ornamental, they're just trying to make a cut. So uh, just a friendly reminder to, and I'll, yeah. I'll add, I agree with that. And I'll add that I saw a post um, a couple of months ago that said no sprays, all organic. And I'm thinking there are so many organic pesticides that you can use, you know, this kind of, uh, you got to know what you don't know before you, you know, go, uh, preaching. So, you know, just because you don't use sprays, look, I don't want to smoke all the bugs that you get on your plants from not spraying, you know, so there's a balance. You want to spray the right things, you know, so it's just, you got to have an understanding of, of what, what is and what isn't. Or, or have a, like I just shared, I think with the group, a Cornell research thing about hemp. And they have actual plots now that they've done the research where they can say, like, this is our no spray plot. Here's how much we're losing to pests. Here's how well it works when we use only um, like predators and things like that. Um, so they can actually have the research. I'm glad to see if you go uh, anybody who's curious, Google Cornell hemp research and even uh, they're doing they'll share information about apple breeding and all sorts of other things on the same page. But uh, it's cool to see. That's how the proper science, I think, is being done. And uh, it's finally being allowed to happen, whether it's hemp, which in my opinion is cannabis. A lot of people will like try and make this big separation and distinction between the two. All the research that's being done on hemp is, I would say, mostly applicable. To it's pretty applicable, hemp, or, I, I think. Uh, THC. Yeah, cannabis. that distinction is not scientific, right? It's political, 100%. Well, I mean, it's just, yeah. it, there's, a, there's a distinction that's valuable, but it's not not for like physiology. You know right. What I mean? As a cannabis yeah. breeder, you could say, look, that's to some degree, hemp. at least. Yeah, yeah. Commercial hemp, you can look at its cannabinoid values, how it flowers, what it looks like, uh, certain resistances. There are, are distinctions from like the old traditional hemp that was like for fiber or for seed. There are very distinct things outside of the legal, but um, that is the main distinction is like, does it have 0 0.3 THC? Are we going to push it up to 1% like, like Sweden and uh, Switzerland and some of these other, other European places, they allow their hemp to be a little bit higher because like I mentioned earlier, even a CBD synthase only plant will be able to produce some amount of THC, which is kind of uh, unfortunate for people that are trying to stay under these very, very strict limitations of 0 0.3 THC. And, and, you know, also like just to, just to add on again to like your guys' really great points about um, being skeptical, like, you know, some people are being, you know, duplicitous, but sometimes people just make mistakes too, you know, like that also happens. Like even the regulation bodies that we're talking about can make mistakes and make the wrong mistakes. And, you know, our, our, all human institutions can be corrupted and things like that too. Uh, so to some degree, right. Well, even not um, on a corruption scale, like I'm just guilty of like, I want certain things to be true because maybe it's a romantic too. idea. So that's if I have too. a theory in my head, there's the confirmation bias. I'll look up like for drought stress, for example, a bunch of people probably are like, Jack, I don't need to drought stress my plants, but like, I like the benefit that I see from it. And there's that one study that I'll stand behind and be like, I do think there's benefit. Um, but I think sometimes we can kind of create the evidence a narrative. for our belief. 
Yeah. And yeah, I think that, yeah, exactly. And, it's confirmation bias, Jack. That's you hit the nail right on the head. It's making up your mind <laughs> about what you want to be true and then finding evidence to support that. Exactly. And I don't even think it's malicious. A lot of times people are just, we are who we are. We have yeah. certain ways of beings and belief and um, it's hard not to, and we have audiences. So we, we try our best to have, I love the panel atmosphere because we all have a different perspective on things. And sometimes we share the same ideas and sometimes we have different opinions. And that's the beauty of these types of uh, formats, in my opinion. Yeah, there's yeah, been I, interesting studies about that. I mean, our ideas about how the world should work influences our understanding of what's going on often more than empirical reality that we're observing. I mean, we choose to ignore things that sort of we can't fit into our puzzles and all that stuff. So it's just part of the way that humans think about things and being aware right. of that helps. Yeah, I, I think that uh, and like so people ask and people do ask me why I'm sort of a stickler about this with regards to microbes in particular that's why i mentioned it and it's, it's simply because like uh there's tons of research not just once article but there's there's many corroborating articles that that kind of show that in most cases like the domestication process of plants like it impairs the and, and destroys um those like really fine-tuned uh genetic interactions that allow cannabis and other plants to like you know, have these really beneficial, what would occur in nature, microbial interactions. And so domestication super attenuates that. Um, so it must be true for the cannabis that we have now, especially when we talk about like prohibition and like growing in circumstances where those microbes might be very, even more unlikely to be interacted with. You know, you do that enough times generationally and you start to have these like downstream effects and no, nobody's wrong for having grown plants that way. Uh, a lot for most of human history, we didn't even know, you know, we didn't really know that we knew that that was the case uh, to some degree. So, but like when you, when you know that fact, it totally changes your perspective about, you know, physiology of the plant. Like I did a lot of research on recently on, um, uh, aphid feeding and the sucrose and, and the ways, the very, very well documented ways that insects feed on sugars and like lots of sugar, in fact, like aphids. And, um, you know, it's like, if you know certain physiological facts about the plant or your pest, then when people try to tell you that something affects the bug in some way that doesn't make any sense in that way, uh, you know, it just changes your perspective. And that's also still a bias, you know, that's still a bias. There might be other contexts that you're not controlling for that we're not aware of in the documented science. So like, it's all bias, but it's, it's funny that you bring of... that one up though, the, the sucrose and the high bricks level, because the whole time I was hearing this push by, I would say like the organic crowd in the cannabis community uh, that, oh, if your bricks is above, what is it? 13 or 14, your plant can't get pests. I heard that hundreds of times, different podcasts, different people, all claiming it, repeating it. And I never really saw any like science or data behind it. But then when I thought about when you were kind of pushing back and saying, hey, you know, yeah, it is possible. Uh, and here are certain examples and cases and you were looking into the research. It reminded me of when I saw people overfeeding with like nitrogen. And I think that brought certain pests, certain plants really like nitrate or nitrite. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's aphids or something like that. And uh, maybe that's just, oh, yeah. Gross. but yeah. So like that reminded me of like, okay, so if you give your plant too much nutrient or food or, or whether it's nitrogen or maybe sugars in your plant, it made me think of like a fat, like unhealthy plant, you know, it's, it's not where it, maybe too much bricks at a point, there's gotta be always a, a limiting level, right? You don't want a, a thousand bricks or a hundred. I don't even know how high it goes. Possibly. I mean, that'd be a lot of, I don't know, like, but you're right. Like I was, I was reading a lot about the, um, how like certain plants will like load the sugars. And I think Dr. MJ probably has some great insight on this, but like how the xylem water channels like dilute into the phloem sieve elements. And so like when the sugars come down and get into the phloem to sink down to the roots, uh, or the reverse when like a plant's sprouting from like a, a carrot root or some other thing, like from the last season. Right. Uh, you know, there's these really interesting, uh, you know, pressure differentials that are happening and it's really, it's really very cool and also not totally understood in some cases. Um, but like that osmotic pressure would be massive, you know, if it was really large and that's literally what's yeah. causing the, um, the contents to move up and down. There's like, a, there's like extreme pressure, like four 
megapascals to give like that's like um you play paintball jack four megapascals is like 500 psi or something like that like that's that's like in the mid-range of like some uh co2 based like paintball markers like the force that they um i think they're keeping contents under pressure potentially um, or maybe just the propulsion force it's crazy but, to imagine because uh, at a certain point that would then imp- make me think that you know like i was saying like a thousand wouldn't be possible the point would literally explode from the inside out yeah yeah agreed that it makes it almost seem like it'd be easier for a plant after a certain threshold maybe like 13 is a good spot to like 18 but then like 21 to like 25 or something it's just so uh basically like pumped full of juice that the bug can just basically barely put any pressure and it is able to pierce the uh armor so to speak and get access to that sweet sweet sugar that it's looking for and attracted to mm-hmm. yeah but apparently in, in artificial cases it was it was feeding on like 30 percent sucrose um by mass you know gram to gram in uh, uh artificial diets and somebody like the pa fit like that's amazing like like bricks levels like they were like uh looking at bricks levels in like um fava bean and and also it depends on the on the veins right like the main veins versus the secondary and tertiary veins um they're going to have different bricks levels too so like if an aphid's like having trouble two things it can do one it's got all those enzymes that are constantly working but if it does happen to get a little bit of you know sugar build up then it can just start drinking a little bit of the xylem which is under negative pressure uh but it can suck it up a little bit um and dilute the gut or it can just you know walk a couple of centimeters away to another vein and probe it and maybe it's at a lower sugar content like um you know bricks changes with sunlight with plant age with um location on the leaf with a bunch of things so it also so is- what's the bricks of an oreo um well there's no solution in the i know i know Oreos and water, i really yeah. really the question that brought that joke was can you give me some context in terms of what a 30% sucrose solution would be for? It would be for... super, it would be really sugary. I don't even think most sodas approach that. There you go. Wow. I think that's yeah. a lot of sugar. So, so 30%. So yeah. And they were like, it was like one mole. So that's like, oh man, that's like 300 plus grams of sugar in like a liter of water that's Probably, how we can yeah. get more sugar to our plant we can use soda because they super heat right. and super cool the <laughs> liquid so they can fit more sugar because when you make lemonade everybody's tried it right you make sugar in the water and at a certain point you get sugar building up at the bottom of your jug well coca-cola and all these other uh, beverage companies figured out hey if we heat it up we can fit even more sugar within that same 12 fluid ounces of uh, volume so that yeah, kind of and then me. put some stabilizers in it but get it super saturated and stabilize it absolutely it's like magic. It's like magic. Yeah. And, you know, what, it, one of the fascinating things that I learned about that is the effect that sugar has on the soft drinks is so much more than just the sweetness. Um, when in fact, when you take the sugar out, like replacing the sweetness is the easiest thing to do. It's the way it makes the beverage feel in your mouth, what they actually call mouth feel. Um, really i did not know that that was the major reason that's yeah so they have to use all sorts of oils in diet sodas to create that same mouthfeel that none of those oils that you see if you read the label on your diet soda is about sweetness it's about recreating like the the heavy feel of the liquid in your mouth so grossed out by diet coke now (laughs) yeah it's that's that's the easiest so that so really it's just the easiest way for them to achieve that objective is with sugar yeah, well, sugar is a damn near miraculous substance. Um, True. I mean, True. it's a preservative. It. Um, the other thing, you know, the reason they put sugar in peanut butter isn't really to sweeten the peanut butter. It's it's for, and I love these terms, it's for go away. Um, if you don't put sugar in peanut butter, it'll stick on the inside of your mouth. <laughs> um, and the, the heavy content of sugar in peanut butter makes it more possible for you to like swallow it and have your mouth be clean after eating it. Nobody likes to have like stuff stuck on the inside of their mouth after eating it. So sugar does all sorts of wonderful things. Wow. I did not know that either. That's cool. That's well, interesting. And it's super addicting too. So oh, I mean, yeah. that's also a fun, <laughs> fun reason that they pump bunches of it in there to keep people drinking that stuff. And uh, definitely not the best for your health in high, high volumes like it is in soda. So Jack's recommendation is avoid that shit if you can. 
I know people that have stopped drinking soda and lose 10 to 20 pounds within a month to two months, just from nothing else, no diet, no exercise change. They just stopped drinking soda, whatever it is, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, whatever. But we're definitely just a pretty bad sort of dietary habits before the weight loss. But yeah, for sure. I also want to say on the topic of like unhealthy plants, I know we're going to wrap up soon, but, um, you know, insects are visually attracted to like green, of course, a lot of the herbivorous ones, um, and also other colors too, but yellow is also, oops, sorry. Yellow is also a really common color and yellow is associated with like senescence, but also like chlorosis if there's like a problem. So in a way you could, I think it's not just that way, actually, but in several ways, I think it's a totally valid statement to say that plants do better when they're producing more sugars for physiological reasons related to like having the resources to like make good relationships with microbes and, you know, grow and uh, have a defense response and immune response and all of that. Um, And also that typical symptoms you'd associate with, I guess, unhealth from a, from a, fitness perspective at least or 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 a dysfunctional perspective um you know those signals those symptoms do uh tell various insects that this may or may not be a suitable plant there's um visual cues olfactory cues um and gustatory cues and i guess you could say uh, chemoreceptory or mechanoreceptory cues too so um there's a there's just like us you know we use all these senses to uh, evaluate our food and other environmental cues. One uh, visual stress that can happen to a plant that I just heard a great tip and I'll shout out Grandmaster Level Show, GML Show on Friday nights. They had Grow Mouse on and they were talking about um, a visual cue that I, reminded me of this was wind stress. And something that I picked up was one of their people said, and I think this makes sense to me, wind stress doesn't come directly just from like wind hitting the plant. It's the amount of uh, basically incorrect moisture in the air. So if the VPD is getting out of range because the plant is no longer able to transpire properly because it's constantly being hit by wind and it's staying in a drier state than it wants to be, that's what ultimately leads to stress. That's why like certain plants outdoor can be in these huge wind storms and they actually don't end up getting wind stressed um, because ultimately they come back to a homeostasis level at a certain point uh, in nature. It's not going to be constant like it would be in a grow room necessarily. But if you keep your like there's some environments like where you can set up a lot of airflow and have your plants not get wind stress, even though there's a lot of wind moving, the plants have enough moisture in the air that they won't necessarily receive that same damage or at least not as quickly. And um, definitely something to look for is if you see maybe a plant that's starting to get a little bit of yellow and some weird, like uh, it almost looks just like lines or slits or like almost a physical damage. Um, there's, there is a point where wind stress can be so high that it's actually blowing leaves off of the plant. And that's obviously a negative thing. And other thing that reminded me uh, of yellow uh, and insect vision was a lot of the sticky cards and, and tapes are yellow. Uh, and I think like a plant, whether it's sick or dying or senescing, oftentimes are yellow leaves across cannabis or other plants. So a lot of like the things that are breaking down and composing uh, dead leaf and material might be going for that. So I think sometimes like fungus gnats and other things get caught on those yellow cards. Yeah, I, uh, it's such a fine line with the wind damage to the leaves. Um, any grower who's experienced uh, powdery mildew and doesn't want to go back will have fans blowing. And yeah, you'll, your leaves will actually get kind of crunchy and uh, die and stuff. But it's like, huh, do I have a little few lower leaves uh, get crunchy and die here? Or do I go back to that powdery mildew? I mean, when I had powdery mildew, I, had, I, I fought it for a long time. And then I finally just lost a couple of my like the, the my profile picture that's a huge bud of hawaiian haze i lost that string because i was just like no i'm done i'm starting over i'm not fighting this anymore and it was one of the best decisions i ever made for my mental health so that that's a fine line between too much airflow and i'm the kind of guy that's just like i'll deal with the problems with the airflow so <laughs> i err on the side of a lot of airflow i definitely notice Newer growers, especially because it's expensive, we have to buy more fans or higher powered fans, uh, tend to skimp on the airflow. And they might even think like, oh, it's my plant. They don't want to have it shaken in the wind. That shaking in the wind develops the roots. And I think it makes a plant grow a thicker stock and, and better side branching. I've seen side by sides actually where people use just a simple six inch clip fan versus no fan. And within like the first three or four weeks, you can tell really distinctly how the fan benefits the plant. 
as long as it's at somewhat reasonable levels. So uh, airflow is crucial. And I think it will help a lot of people avoid a lot of the things we talked about earlier, like powdery mildew and uh, bud rot. We are coming up to the final five minutes of the show and there's six of us here. So I think uh, it gives us about a minute each to do our sign outs and I'll pass it first to Matthew Gates. Yes, uh, I really appreciated the conversations we had. I feel like I say basically the same thing every time, but that's the place I want to be because I like the interaction of the chat. And I thought we had a, a really uh, a great bevy of questions and um, I got to talk IPM and a bunch of other cool stuff. So I'm always into that. If you want to find more information about IPM and plant health, you can follow me on three accounts. My Twitter and Instagram are at SyncAngel, and you can find my YouTube channel at Xenthanol. And I recently made a video about the root mealybugs, which are kind of a newly documented insect for those who are coming in later, uh, on cannabis. Uh, so if you want to get some information about this relatively newly documented pest in cannabis, then you can come over to that video and check it out. Uh, we're currently running some treatments in Chile, and I'm looking to see the results of some hot water bath treatments that work in other cultivation situations. So I'm excited to be talking about some cannabis pest news for once. Always good when there's news, uh, something new to talk about. Good stuff. And next up, we have Dr. MJ. Hey, yeah, I'm happy to be back this week. This was fun. I'm seeing comments in the, the chat that are talking about it being a great show. And I agree. You guys are always fun to hang out with. I am Dr. MJ Coco from Coco for Cannabis. Um, we are doing the Plant Training Grow Challenge right now. Flip date is coming up on October 1st. I still haven't popped my seeds for that. So it's not too late to join us. Keep it grow journal. We're doing a bunch of cool giveaways this year. Um, that goes up through December and we got some other giveaways. You can check out the deals and discounts page. And, um, yeah, I've just finished moving. So I'm settling into my new place and I'll be getting out some more cool content. I'm going to be doing a YouTube uh, video journal of my grow in addition to, uh, a grow journal on cocoa for cannabis. So you guys can subscribe to my YouTube channel and check that out and grow or love everyone i'll be back next week and i should be able to be around for a while now so you'll have to get used to me again but uh, grow or love thanks jack thanks panel thanks chatters and i'll see you next week we're happy to have you back and uh, i know a lot of uh green hearts in the chat and uh, people happy to see you again as well as the next person who i'm going to pass it to aaron the grower uh happy to have you back and uh, final thoughts and shout out yeah thanks jack uh thanks chat especially um mad love for everybody who set well wishes during our hardest times. Um, it's been an absolute nightmare, but there's been some blessings along the way. You know, I depth this year, so I finished everything early and we were able to get everything done before the smoke came. Um, shout out Kyle, uh, predicated breeding. You know, he's not on the show tonight, but um, you know, he's a good buddy of mine and we got some projects in the works. Um, what else did I want to mention? Yeah, I took a picture with Takashi69. Check out my Instagram and throw throw some shade at me like uh, like a lot of <laughs> other people. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that's it. Love you guys. Oh, I'm Aaron the Grower, ATG Acres uh, on Instagram, ATG Acres on YouTube, and ATGAcres.com. And we had a really heavy Thanks. conversation about bug vision on my YouTube channel too, so you can check him out there as well. Yes, sir. Excellent information over there. And as far as the 6 9 thing... Uh, I will say, guys, he just bumped into him at the airport. It's not like Aaron was, uh, you know, confidential informant. He's not snitching on anybody. We can all <laughs> right. chill. I know. Who's, it's like, uh, I mean, bro, even if Takashi said it was like, yo, you want to collaborate? I, I'd probably say no. Right. But like the photograph, of course, of course. He And by the way, he I'm staring at this guy in the airport and he's like, nods at me and i'm like all right so i came over sat down he was nice as fuck like you know you just you never know until you meet somebody and i don't know i don't i don't pay enough attention to the drama i didn't even know i mean i heard he was a snitch but i didn't really i don't know enough to care i just know he's the face of a fucking meme so it's hilarious and he's famous probably the most famous person i ever met so i was gonna say that I, yeah. I looked at the amount of followers he had i was like that's probably one of the most famous people you'll ever run across so uh, yep. I don't blame you for taking a picture with a man. And uh, I hope that people just understand it's not yeah. any deeper than that. So 
Exactly. Yeah, no, next up, we got Noah the Groa, recently a grandpa. So congratulations, Grandpa Noah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, I had a great time. Uh, a lot of interesting conversation, you know, the molasses thing and the microbes. And, uh, I, you know, I really was really engaged and uh, really listened to a lot of everybody's perspectives because it is kind of a, you know, rabbit hole. There's not a lot of research on it. But yeah, I had a great time. Uh, I'm uh, Noah the Grow on Instagram with two E's. You can find me there or here most weeks. And uh, yeah, I'm just had a great show and uh, see everybody next week. Thank you again for joining us. And before I pass it to the American one, I'll make his job a little easier on the sign out. Don't forget to follow P Breeding, uh, Predicative Breeding on all social media platforms and check out pbreeding.com for feminized seeds and also rust.brandon. Uh, he also was not able to join us and also Spartan Grown. Uh, check out Spartan Grown on Instagram and Spartan Grown at gmail.com. Those three are uh, awesome panel members and hopefully we see them back again soon. But uh, last and certainly not least, I'm growing his Amy Aces, which is smelling better and better and chunking up and looking really nice. Uh, the American one. Jack, awesome uh, hosting again this week, and thanks to everyone on the panel. It was always good, and uh, sorry I wasn't more participatory in chat, but uh, it's good seeing everybody, and yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks, as always, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you, and uh, everybody in the chat, thank you for listening live. I'm going to try and get this out as uh, I did last week within the next half an hour to the podcast listeners. I uh, appreciate everybody here uh, live with us on the YouTube for participating in the uh, little um panel questions that we had the uh i'm forgetting what the word is for it uh like a straw poll i guess so thank you all for participating and giving q us and a right about, yeah the, the q a and then just like voting on the topics so thank you all for participating in that and uh showing up live having a good time with each other in the chat and uh keeping us entertained and giving us something to talk about and uh with that being said i'm at jack greenstock you can find me mostly on instagram uh, i'm also jack underscore greenstock on twitter or you can email me at jackgreenstock47 at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want a copy of my book, 50strains.com. Thank you all for joining us. Jack Greenstock, signing out. Grow love, everyone. Keep growing.